I'm Grant from Blackmagic Design, and I wanted to give you an update on some new products today. Uh, we even have some new cameras, so let's get started. Um, now, first, I wanted to talk about ATEM Television Studio. The original model was very exciting, but it's you know it's time to replace it. We've learned so much, and we've got a lot of new ideas. Um, there's also some things we can do better now. I think the old model of ATEM Television Studio was a little bit confusing, you know, the family, because we had both rack mount and panel based models in the family. Um, we think ATEM Television Studio should probably just be a panel based design, and that's a lot easier to understand. Plus, we have ATEM Constellation for anyone who needs a rack mount switcher. Uh, one of the other issues with the old models is we designed them to fit in a rack shelf, but no one actually used them that way. Um, so I don't think we have to fit into a rack width. Plus, the old models used an audio fader as a transition control, but everybody loves a T-bar. So the new design should have a T-bar fader. Um, also, the old models didn't have streaming. They didn't have any recording. You know, it's a portable design, so we think it should have this. Um, and the old model was also a mix of SDI and HDMI, which is a bit confusing. A lot of people needed more than four SDI inputs. Um, so we've had a lot of thoughts on what the new model could become, and it's time to update the design. Now, the new model's called ATEM Television Studio HD8. Um, let me bring it out and show you. Got one here. There it is. You know, it's a television studio you can hold in your hands. It's all self-contained. Everything you need is built into this one single design. Now, it's a powerful 1ME live production switcher built into a high-end broadcast panel. So it's pretty much the most portable high-end solution you can get. It's a true high-end design, but it's, so it's easy to carry into venues. Um, particularly hard to access locations, like such, you know, downstairs basement comedy clubs or music venues. You can, you know, sometimes you've got small control rooms that have no space in them. And even broadcast vans, you can build a broadcast van with this without a lot of clutter, because you don't need any external equipment. So let me explain some of the features on this new design. Um, so it's wider than the old panel. Um, that's because we wanted to fit more features and lay it out properly. It's a standard broadcast panel layout, so it's very familiar to, de you know, design to broadcasters. We actually have this flange all the way around the perimeter, which means you can flush mount it into a desk so it becomes totally flat. Um, I think I've got a slide I can bring up to show that. Um, now we include a template in the box to help you cut the hole. Now not everyone can cut holes in their desks, but it's a great way to install it. Uh, it also has adjustable feet so you can tilt the back up. Um, now it's built from carbon fiber reinforced polycarbonate, so it's lighter than the old design, which is a thick metal. Um, but it is a high-end design with extremely high quality buttons. Um, and there's actually spaces between the groups of buttons, which means you can operate the panel by feel. Um, so it means you can keep your eye on the multi-view. You know, live production is so busy, you can't take your eyes off the action to look down at the panel all the time. Um, it's really nice to be able to feel your way around the panel. And it's a great upgrade from ATEM Mini, you know, because obviously ATEM Mini is a true production switcher internally. Now we've got a true production on, you know, switcher on the outside as well as the inside. So let's check out the back panel first. That's where all the connections are. So I'll turn it around. So you can get a bit of a close-up there. So you can see the, uh, the first connections are the AC power. We've got AC and DC power, which is great because you can plug in an alternative power supply if the uh, main power supply goes out, or like battery packs or generators. It's got reference in with loop. Um, it's got time code generator built in with a, with a time code output as well as an input to lock it externally. Now it's got MADI audio in on the back there, which supports 32 channels of external audio channels from like a um, external 32 channels into the audio mixer that's built inside. So there's an extra 32 channels in the audio mixer from the MADI. Now that's great for adding extra sources. Um, and all those inputs, plus all the inputs into the audio mixer have processing. There's also a MADI output, which is a little bit different. What we do is we take all the audio from the switch and feed it out of that connector. So you can send all your audio out to an external uh, mixer, which is great if you've got like an independent audio guy and he's doing all the audio, you're not actually doing it yourself, so you can just pass all the audio out to him. Uh, so it's fantastic, just with that single MADI connection. Now we've got USB, we've actually got two USB ports there, you can see, you can get in close. Um, we use those to record to external disks, uh, but also it works as webcam. So like you can actually connect the switcher to a computer and the computer thinks it's a webcam, which means you can actually do a live production in, into Zoom, Teams or WebEx, which is a fantastic way of you know, doing a really high quality presentation. Also, you can use the USB to connect to the ATEM software control. So it's a great way of you know, connecting really simply without using the Ethernet, but you can use both Ethernet and USB, but the USB is good for that. Now there's an RS-422 port there, over there, which is uh, used for like the big automation systems used by broadcasters. There's also an RJ45 talkback expansion connector, which is to plug into third-party talkback systems. So you can use this switcher with you know, full third-party talkback. We've also got eight Along there, we've got eight 3G SDI inputs. Now, all inputs have standards conversion, so the inputs just work. You can plug anything in and it works. You can connect uh, 720p, 1080i, 1080p up to 60 frames a second, um, so that's really nice. 
And another thing we've got along the top is eight program video outputs, which sounds a little strange, but we actually send program feeds back to the cameras. So the camera operator can push the program button and actually see what the switch is doing. And it's really nice to, to do that. But we also use that camera you know, return feedback to the camera for camera control and talk back and tally. So having eight outputs means we've got one output for each camera. So we can, you don't need extra boxes or converters. Another new thing we've got on the TV studio is we've actually got a new audio mapping on the SDI outputs. So you use the ATEM software control to set this up. But what you can do is you can customize all the embedded audio channels in the SDI outputs with various audio sources that are available to the switcher. So you can just pack the embedded audio outputs with all kinds of different audio feeds and send them off to a hyperdeck to record the whole lot. Now also along the back there, you can see we've got two aux outputs, which is great for on stage monitors or video walls. Um, any input can be sent to the aux out, even clean feeds, which are kind of like before the downstream key. So you can feed like a, a clean feed out to Hyperdex without titles, but you could have titles and things coming up on, on video walls and things like that. So that's really convenient. Now we've got dedicated aux switching on the front panel, which I'll show you in a minute, but we also have a countdown timer on aux one. So you can feed a presenter monitor with a countdown timer or and you can count down, count up or time of day so presenters can keep track of what they're doing. Now there's a main program SDI there, uh, which is you know, the main output. Um, there's also a multi-view output, which you can see. Now we've got both 3G SDI and HDMI for the multi-view out, so you don't need an external SDI to HDMI converter if you're using a computer monitor. You know, it's important that everything's built into the switcher, so we've done that. Now next up, we've got something that's a bit new for us. It's got control room and studio uh, monitoring, audio monitoring. So what we've done is um, we've got one output for the control room, and one out for the studio floor, because we've got talkback built in. And so, you had bounced analog outputs, you can use them with powered speakers, and you've got audio monitoring and control from the front panel here. So, you know, you've got literally your audio monitoring in the studio is, is built in. Now, we've got RCA outputs down the end there, which is great for, you know, connecting music. Sometimes if you're in a venue and you're waiting for, you know, people to attend and sort of to come in, or the stream hasn't started yet, or sorry, the stream started, but you haven't really, the, the event hasn't started, having some music's great. So having just a hi-fi input is really nice for that. And then we have the XLR uh, inputs there for line level audio, allows external audio mixers to be, you know, analog audio mixers to be connected. And we also have an industry standard five pin talkback headset. We used uh, aviation headsets on the old model, but on this model we've used standard, um, industry standard broadcast headsets because they're more common now. Um, so I think it's really exciting. We've got a lot of features and you can see why the panel's a bit wider because it lets us fit all that. Anyway, let's the back panel. Let's go around and check out the front panel now. So we'll turn it around. All right. I'll plug in the power now so I can show you how it works. Yeah, it runs Blackmagic OS, so it powers up really quickly. Um, now let's connect up the multi-view. So I'll need a monitor for that, so I'll, I'll put a monitor here. So now I'll plug in the multi-view, which is here. Okay. Move that over a bit. Now we need some video sources. Uh, now I've got some Hyperdex behind me we can use. Plus I've got a 4K studio camera here. Uh, so let's load up the input with a whole bunch of sources. So I've got my cables here. Input eight. Put seven. Put six. Input five. Input four. Three. Almost all full, two, and I'll plug my 4K studio camera into input one. And I've got the program return, which I'll use one of those cool SDI outputs for the program return. All right. Okay, so now let's plug in the computer I got over here. So I'll plug in the ethernet. Um, also I'll plug in the internet at the same time because I've got the internet and a cable to that computer. Okay, uh, now let's go up and run the ATEM software control and I can show you the switcher over here. Oh, it's come up. Now the multi-view supports up to 16 sources on a single monitor and I can change the multi-view sources in the ATEM software control. So I'll show you that over here. Um, oh, there it is there. Um, now I'm using 10 views at the moment but I can change it to 16 just by going to these icons here and then you'll see it changes and also if you look back at the multi-view you can see that. Um, there's also status screens available. Uh, we can have more than just video sources. We can actually have status. Um, so what I'll do is I'll change that back. Um, and I can select the, uh, some of the, I'll, I'll, I won't use all eight cameras. I'll use a uh, recording status and streaming status. That'll help us when I'm showing you how it works. 
So it's pretty cool. Now I'll go back and, uh, so you can see really how flexible the multi-view is. Now I'll go back and show you the front panel. Um, now there's lots of buttons on the panel, um, but everything's laid out in a really logical way that's very easy to use. If you've used ATEM Mini before, you'll love the extra functions that are available here. I'll go through how the panel works. Sorry if you already know how this works, but I think if you're coming up from ATEM Mini, it's nice to kind of get an idea of what's actually on the front panel. Now, I think the first thing to start with is, is the program bus. Um, now the program buttons are actually the same as those big buttons on the ATEM Mini. Anything you select on them will be output to the program output instantly. Um, so you can see along here, now, we actually have labels on the LCD. There's a, you should have an overhead there if we can have a look. Um, they're electronic labels, you can see them along there, um, which means we can actually do button remapping because they're not hard labels. Um, you can have 10 inputs along here, but you can also use the shift key for an extra 10 sources. So if I, I if you can get a view of that, if I can push the shift key, you can see there's extra sources. Um, there's an overhead view. So that means you can get 20 sources on the panel. Now, the problem with switching on the program bus is it's a little bit dangerous. On ATEM Mini, that's really the only choice you've got unless you run the software. Now, uh, you could make a mistake if you're switching because if you press the wrong button, it'll go to air instantly. And what you really want to do, you know, is see that source before you use it. And that's what the preview bus down here is for. Um, so I can show you there. So what it means is I can see a shot before I use it. Um, and as I change the preview bus, you can see it up on the multi-view. And then when you're happy with the shot, you can just press the cut button and it'll bring it on air. So I can select a shot. And I can push cut and it'll bring it on air. You know, it's such a simple way to work, but it eliminates mistakes. You can see what you're doing before you do it because you can see it on the multi view. Now, the next area over here is transitions, and we've got a whole bunch of different transitions. Um, I'll come over the other side here. Um, it's hard to reach around the panel. Now, we just did a cut transition, but you can do things like mixes. Um, now, there's a dedicated button for cut, which is the button that we used here. But if you want to do um, like other transitions, then you use the auto button, and um, you can see it here. So we have mix selected there. Or I can use the T-bar, which is the nice T-bar here. So you can see there on the program view. Here you get full manual control with the T-bar. It's so nice and smooth. It's a wonderful T-bar. It's really nice. It's the same one used on our big panels. Now there's obviously other transition buttons here. We've got like dip, um, which is there. Um, and you can see that's, that's a dip to color. So it goes by one of the color generators. There's also wipes, so you can do wipes. Uh, diamond wipe, everyone loves those. So it's quite cool. Now you'll actually notice that as I was selecting various uh, transitions, the system control over here actually followed. Now this is where you change all the settings. Um, now you can actually push manual menu buttons, which are over here. I'll come around here. There's all the manual menu buttons to get different settings, but it actually often will follow what you're doing. But you'll actually notice that down here I've got uh, another row that's suddenly lit up and the light's flashing. That's called the select bus. Now what it does is it allows you to select sources for effects, such as the dip source. At the moment it's flashing because that's the color generator. Whoops, I'll move my arm out of the way there, see? Um, so it's much faster than using the system control because you can just you know, um, push buttons directly along there, so it's really quite quick. Now one of the other buttons we've got down here which is in this section is called preview um, transition. Preview transition lets you see an effect before you use it. I'll show you. You'll actually see the effect will come up on the, on the uh, preview side of the multi-view, and then as I transition that, you can see I can try that, that wipe out before I do it. Um, and you can see it's only on the preview. So I know it's, you know, I know an effect's right before I use it. Now this is really important for complex effects. So the preview transition button is awesome. It's a, such a nice thing just to have there. Okay, let's have a look at some more of the transitions. So I'll come back over here. Um, there's obviously a lot more transitions. We've got DVE transitions. DVE transitions move the whole image. So if I press DVE, so you can see it there. It's pretty cool, actually. There's actually a, a whole bunch of different types of DVE transitions. They can also be used for stinger transitions. Now, stingers are actually a wipe where they put a graphic over the, over the wipe edge. They're often used in sports, and the DVE can be used to move the graphic over the wipe edge as, as you're doing the wipe. So they're pretty cool. Um, and you can just use different kind of types of graphics and things. Plus, there's actually also a super source built in. Now, super source has actually got four extra DVEs built in. It's actually like a multi-layer processor. And you can, it's great for interviews, you know, where you're doing those sort of side-by-side -side shots where you get different people arranged. And there's actually some example graphics for, um, for SuperSource as well. So there's actually five DVs in there. Now we also have uh, four upstream ATEM advanced chroma keyers. Um, now I can turn a keyer on with the on button. So you can see there. Now I've got a graphic in Media Player One um, and the graphic has an alpha channel, um, which is why the graphic's partially transparent. But uh, keyers can also be transitioned. So if I want to do that, I just use the key one button here. Um, 
and I can transition. Oops, I'll go for a mix. There you go. See, so it's pretty cool. Um, and I can also transition the key and the video together. So to do that, I just push the background and the key, out. and now I'll actually transition the image with the graphic loaded on the new source, which is pretty cool. Um, so which means the new source is now on air, but the title came on with it, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll set it back to background, so we're just using normal transitions. And now we also have two downstream keys, which are over here. Now they're great for logos and titles. Um, the downstream keys are after uh, all the other processing, so they're at the end of the processing chain. So I can turn on a, um, a key with that. I can just turn the keys on. Oops, actually, I'm, am I fading that? Ah, there it is. That's, I pushed the wrong button. So that's cutting the key on and off, but I've also got an auto button below just for that particular key. I can fade. It looks like the key duration's pretty fast on that. So it's coming on pretty quick. Now I can also, again, link those to the transition by using the tie button up here. So if I do that, then it'll link the downstream keyer with the transition. So it's pretty cool, you know? Um, so the keyers are very powerful and they're very flexible. Now right at the very end on the panel over here, we've got uh, a fade to black. Um, and that's used at the end of the pro, you know, show to fade everything to black. It doesn't matter what's happening on the switcher. If you push fade to black, it'll just fade the output down, which is how you finish your program. And it flashes, it's like a little protective guard so you don't hit that accidentally. It's the last button you want to push accidentally. Now next up here, we've got the streaming control. Um, now I've already entered some streaming service details over here, so you can just start streaming right from the front panel. Again, it's got a guard on it so you don't actually turn off the streaming. Now I'm live streaming. Of course, the stream's not public, so it's not like you're going to be able to go to YouTube and watch this, but um, it's pretty cool. Now the streaming works in progressive video formats because streaming services don't support inlaced video, um, but the switcher will convert any input, interlaced input automatically to progressive, so you don't have to worry, you can just run the switcher progressive. Um, now the switcher needs to be connected to the internet for streaming to work, now I connected Ethernet here, but you can connect the phone for mobile data, just plug it into the USB, and the switcher will automatically switch between Ethernet and the phone for redundancy, so if the Ethernet goes out, it'll switch to the phone to keep the, keep the streaming going. Um, and it even keeps the phone charged because you're plugging it into the USB. So I'll turn the streaming off. Um, so next over here we've got the record controls. Um, now there's recording on and off, uh, it works by you know, plugging USB disks in. You just press the record button, which is here. Um, there's also a disk change button, so you can change the disk, and there's also a still button, so you can grab a still. Um, however, that's not the best part um, of ATEM TV Studio. What we've actually done is we've added the, an option, you've got the ability to put an optional M.2 flash memory card into the switcher. So if you do that, you actually get a built-in Blackmagic Cloud Store. So you can record into internal storage. You don't need any external USB disks, and you can share that um, internal storage over the network. In fact, even the external disks also share over the network. You can also, because it's a Blackmagic Cloud Store, you can sync that internal disk to Dropbox and Google Drive. So your reseller can add a, a flash memory card into the switcher for you. We've actually got a two terabyte card installed here. So let me show you how to use it. Now there's no USB disks connected to the switcher. It just, all it knows is about is the internal storage. So it just records automatically. So let's just start recording. There it is. Now it's recording internally without any external disks. So we can come over here and do some cuts. Um, then we can come along here and stop recording. Just created a mini show. And I can access my um, recording over here on the computer on the network. So all I have to do is come over here and mount the disk because this computer is connected to the Ethernet switch in the back. There it is there. There's internal storage. And there's my video file. So I'm playing this direct out of the switch. I didn't need to copy any files. I can just play the file. That's because the, in storage, the internal storage is also network storage. Anyone on the network can access this media. It's really nice. It's like a whole different thing. Now, one of the other things I wanted to talk about is redundancy. I'll close all that. Um, so the, obviously, the, one of the questions you ask about when everything's built in is, what do you do if you break a connector? Um, now, we do have some redundancy. We've got four Ethernet ports. We've got two USB-C ports, and we've got two power connections. But ATEM, ATEM TV Studio is also repairable. Now the internal circuit boards can be changed, which means that a technician can repair it. I think I have a slide that I can bring up that shows what the internals look like. It sort of shows an expanded view. Um, and you can see there's multiple boards, so you can actually, these boards can be swapped to repair it. Now I'll actually show you a couple of these boards. I've got a few here. Here they are here. We can get a close up of that. Um, so these are the boards that are internal that actually have the connections on them. And you can buy these as spare parts. Um, so this is what you'd swap if you had a, like a broken connector, if, you know, 
using one in a school or something and the kids are crazy. Um, so that's how you'd fix it. Or, you know, if you're a technician, of course, sometimes these connectors will be replaced if you're really good with the soldering iron, but basically you can buy these as spare parts. They're not too expensive because they're simple, so they're quite low cost. Anyway, let's continue with the front panel. Um, so many things to talk about. So next what we've got over here is the aux control. So you can see it there. Um, now you can live switch the uh, aux outputs. Um, so what I'll do is actually I'll move the monitor across the aux. So instead of watching this, we can view the aux output. So There we are there. Now I've got uh, multi-view selected. Um, so now we're monitoring the aux output and I can route buttons on there. It makes aux switching very fast, but as I had before, I can also switch to the multi-view over here um, using the button marked multi-view or M slash V. Now what this does, it lets you switch between the multi-view and the preview bus because it's got like, two labels on it. It's really great when you're using a small monitor and you want to switch to the preview bus quickly um, to see cameras full screen. And obviously with a portable switch, you tend to use smaller monitors. Then you can change back to the multi-view. So you can just switch backwards and forwards. Let me show you. So there's the preview. And now if I switch along the preview, see? So I can have the monitor full screen. I get a quick view of my cameras, check that I'm focused. Then I can come back and switch to the multi-view. So I can just jump backwards and forwards, which is really cool. Okay, so now let's talk about the audio mixer, which is uh, really uh, an exciting area because it's a whole new design. I'll come back over this side. Um, so the audio mixer has processing on all the inputs, so it's very powerful, but we wanted a better way to access the power of that audio mixer from the front panel. And it's really important, obviously, when you're working by yourself. Uh, so let me explain how this actually works. Now, the LCD here has all the user feedback on it. I'll get my hand out of the way so you can see there's a close-up overhead we can get of that. Uh, and you can see below that there's 10 knobs, and these are for adjusting, essentially, the controls on the screen levels in this case. Um, you can also see the label, you know, what they're for. Now below that is actually soft buttons, and these labels on the bottom of the screen here are actually what the buttons control. Um, there's also a solo button here, which works with the monitoring. Um, and yeah, so you can solo one of those sources. And then below that is a select button, which actually selects which of the channels you're actually working on when you go deeper. Um, and then to the right of that is these processing buttons over here, which is the type of processing that we're using. It lets you change the processing that's displayed on the audio mixer LCD. At the moment it's currently set to level, because that's what we're doing. So adjusting any of these knobs would actually adjust the input level. Now I, could, I should quickly explain the audio monitoring controls up here, so you can get a shot of that. They're over here at the top. Um, now this controls the sound, this area controls the sound of the headset as well as the control room speakers. So there's a speaker button there, you can see that uh, turns on the control room speakers. There's also a, a PGM mix button, which is the program mix button, and enables uh, program audio to go to the monitoring, because you can have just talkback or you can have program uh, audio or both. There's a dim button that reduces the audio level to the monitoring, which is great when you want to talk to someone and you just don't want the sound to be as loud. But there's also a mute button that totally mutes the monitoring. We also have a CANS button that turns on the sound of the talkback headset, because you can actually turn that off. And there's also a talk button that uh, turns on the microphone to the talkback headset. Now I think if you're doing talkback, you probably normally would have those on, but you do have the option to turn them off. And there's also a studio button, and that lets you talk to the studio floor. It's great for getting attention in the studio. Um, you know, a lot of times people aren't on the cameras and they're fuffing around in the studio, and you're getting close to the time for the stream, and you're like, hey guys, you know, you can just talk to the studio floor, but obviously you wouldn't want to push that when you're actually on a job. Then there's a call button that lets you flash the tally lights on all the cameras if you push that. Now anyway, let's go back to the audio mixer down here, if you can get a shot of that. Now the audio mixer user interface is displayed on the LCD, and um, you can see the features there. Um, so all the sources are displayed here, and they generally align with the input numbers. You can see the, the sort of camera numbers align with those input numbers along the bottom of the panel. But you can split audio channels and remap, so they don't necessarily always align. That's why you've got along the top of the screen, you've got the actual labels. Um, that shows you what adjustment you're controlling. Here it says levels along those labels there, because we're actually currently set to levels. Um, now you can see there's also an audio meter for each input. Um, and you can adjust the audio level of the knob. Now the meter's color when it's enabled, and everything's off at the moment, that's why it's gray. So let's turn on some of the uh, audio. You can see them coming up, color. Um, and we can also adjust the output by pressing master. So at the moment we're adjusting inputs, but if we go over to the master over here, now it's changed to the outputs. And you can see here we've got all the outputs, and I can adjust the master output. So I'm going to just adjust that there. That changes the level. Uh, but there's also other outputs here, like um, you can see the talkback headset and things. Anyway, let's go back to levels. 
Um, now we don't have a lot of enough space in here for all the inputs, um, but you can bank through the pages of audio sources. So like that includes the RSA and XLR audio inputs, as well as all the MADI channels. Even the talkback microphone actually has an input to the audio mixer, so you can use like the talkback microphone for commentary. So I'll show you how that works. All I have to do is bank to the right, and you can see now I've got some of the additional channels. That's all the MADIs. Um, back to the cameras. That's quite easy, so you can actually have a lot more inputs than that will fit. Um, now, these adjustments are the main levels, but sometimes there's not enough space for all the adjustments. So that's what the alt button's for, which we have over here. So it's alternative adjustments. So sometimes, you know, you want to have more adjustments than are actually there. So if I push that, you can see it's changed over to the gain. Now, these are the ga input gains before the processing, but the normal levels are actually after all the processing. So you can see we've got the main levels, but we can also jump in before the audio mixing processing and actually do the input gain by pushing Alt. And a lot of the different processing's got Alt functions. Anyway, now let's check out the rest of the processing features. And they're along the right-hand side here. So I can uh, set the pan, so I can change the pan. So you can see that there. Um, pan's mostly used when you're splitting audio channels into like mono, two mono sources, unless you position those mono sources in the stereo mix. Um, but some of the other processing is where it actually really gets exciting. So. Let's have a look over at the EQ. Now, pan and level, so this is an interesting point that's important to understand. Pan and level both work on separate channels. So each knob's a separate channel, um, and the meters are separate. Um, but the other processing actually use all the buttons and knobs together. So they actually work on a single input. So they're all sort of separate parameters of, of a single input. So we have now, we, what we can do is have 10 buttons and knobs for a single channel. But first we need to select which channel to adjust, and that's what the, uh, we can select the camera as a source. So I can push one of these select buttons here, and you can see we're highlighting the channel that we actually want to adjust, and that's what the select buttons are for. And now when we press EQ, we're now adjusting all the controls. So you can see this is where how powerful the audio mixer really is. Now the whole display is actually dedicated to the EQ, and each knob is now a parameter of the EQ. We can see the main frequency bands of the EQ here, and we can adjust the frequency and gain of the EQ band. So let's do that. So we can come along here and we can adjust um, I'm going to get my hand in the way so you can see. So you can also turn on and off the EQ, which I can do over here. See? So the buttons are remapped to different functions. And there's also a reset button for the EQ as well here. See? Just reset it. Um, so if you've got multiple sources all mixed together, then it can get a little bit hard to do things like EQ. And this is where the solo buttons uh, work. So you can press the solo button and now it'll highlight that single channel on the monitoring. Let's you hear that single input only. It really helps when you're adjusting the EQ because you don't get the traction of all the other sources. Um, now it's worth noting that the EQ stays on the display as you're moving between sources. So say I go to this one and I adjust it up. As I'm selecting, I can go between sources um, and it stays on the EQ display, um, which is cool. So you always know which channel you're adjusting um, because it's selected there and the display's on the top there to show you what it is. So while we're in the EQ, let's check out the alt adjustments. So we go across here, and you can see that there is alternate adjustments. It's the Q factor control for the gains over there that have changed. In fact, I'll push it a few times so you can see it change. There it is there, see? It's changed to the Q factor. That's the width of the audio band that you're adjusting. So you can really see how the alt controls can be used. And, you know, most pages have alternate adjustments. Also, one other thing, we've actually got a six-band uh, parametric EQ, but we're only seeing four bands here. Um, so you can actually page the display. So you can, you can have more content than what fits. So if you want to see the other two bands, then all you have to do is push EQ again. Oops, I'll get my hand out of the way so you can see that. See, there's the other two bands. And you can also do it on the very left-hand side there. You'll see there's a, uh, you can see the page indicator, but you can also do it with a knob here. So you can just rotate through the, the pages. So it's pretty cool. Now it's worth noting you don't have to push the select to change the inputs that you're adjusting. It can be annoying to keep up by pressing the select all the time. Plus it's really easy to forget what actually input you're adjusting. So the input will auto select as you push buttons along the preview row. So let me show you that too. So I'm pushing the buttons along the preview row and you can see the, it's changing. Or if I adjust the knob on the levels page, it'll actually auto select. Oops, I'm if I go to this knob, so you can see the select has moved back. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, so you can see the select is shifting to match the cameras on the preview bus. Um, plus, I'm still in the EQ, well, I was in the EQ page, I'll go back to the EQ page. 
So it means what I'm doing is if I'm moving around the preview bus, I can really quickly just adjust whatever camera I'm looking at is the one I'm adjusting. Okay, now let's check out some of the other processing we've got. We've got obviously an expander, which is over here. You can see it there. Um, you can see the expander controls. Now the expander controls are grayed out because you know um, it's turned off. Um, if you want to press, if I press the on button, there, they'll come on. So you can change that change to color when you turn them on and off. I'll leave them off, we don't really want that on. Um, okay, so next up is the compressor. So that's over there. So you can see the compressor controls. We have an audio compressor obviously built in. We also have a limiter built in. This is on every input, have these. Um, so you can see there, and we also have a noise gate over there. So you can see the noise gate controls. So you can really see how much audio control you have. Um, it's amazing to be able to access all that from the deck of the switcher now. But we thought we could take it a little bit further. In fact, a lot further. Uh, we thought we could use it for camera control. Now our cameras have color correctors built in and they can be remote controlled. Um, and we also have support for camera control. So that's what we've done. We've added support for camera control in this section here. So let me show you how that works. So I have a Blackmagic Studio Camera 4K Pro here. It's connected using Ethernet to this studio converter. And the studio converter is basically converting Ethernet to video. So the program output of the ATEM is connected to the program input, program return back to the camera here. And that's how the talkback, like I mentioned before, that's how the talkback and tally goes back to the camera. So now I can control the cameras from the panel. So let me show you how that works. So all I need to do is press cam. Now we've got exposure controls, lens control, color correction adjustments. It's pretty cool. So I can come along here and adjust the iris. Um, oh, actually, I've got to adjust camera one there. And here we are. Okay, there we are. See, I'm adjusting the, the iris. There's also camera gain in there I can do. It's pretty cool. Now I've also got uh, focus adjustment over here. So I can. So cool. And I can even push the autofocus button. You see the button maps to an autofocus function. There it is there. Now we've got a lens that's got zoom support, so we can actually even adjust the zoom. See, how cool is that? Do some focus. That's so cool. And also we have uh, color tint controls uh, for the color corrector in here, so I can come along to the red side, really run in a ton of red. Oops, sorry, my hand's in the way there. I'll get down there a bit. And there's also reset buttons for those color correctors, so I can reset them. Now the color corrector on the Blackmagic Studio cameras is a DaVinci primary color corrector, and it actually works in YRGB. This is very creative because you can adjust the white channel independently of the red, green, and blue. It, may, you know, it really makes the whites kind of pop. It's actually quite nice from a creative point of view. So I can come along here and adjust the, the Y gain up. I mean, I'm just playing around really. Um, so it's pretty cool and reset that. Now there's actually three pages of adjustments for the camera control. So if I push camera again, I can see now I've got uh, full lift, gamma, and gain con color corrector controls, which is a lot more control. And the alternative controls are actually the, um, the Y gains. Oops. Um, and there's also a third page of camera controls in here. Now we've got a lot more controls for tint and color temperature. We can also adjust the white balance, contrast, saturation, and hue. Uh, we can even adjust the sensitivity and shutter speed of the camera here, so it's pretty cool. Um, so you can see how I can move between the cameras on the preview bus, and then the camera controls will automatically change um, between the cameras. Um, as I'm changing cameras, I can see the LCD camera controls change. You know, you really see how amazing this is. It's so nice to have the camera control built in. So this is such a big switcher. It's got so much equipment built in. You know, it's a powerful ATEM switcher. It's a broadcast control panel. It's got hardware streaming built in. It's got a recorder built in. It has a Blackmagic cloud store if you add the media card. Plus it also includes talkback and an ethernet switch and an audio mixer. It's basically a whole television studio and one switcher. So we work, but we, you know, with all that stuff in it, we work pretty hard to make it affordable. Um, we did a bit of checking around to calculate the cost of all the equipment built in to sort of really explain what's in here. Now an ATEM 1ME Constellation HD switcher is 995. An ATEM 1ME control panel is 2995. A Blackmagic web presenter HD for streaming is 495. And it's got a Hyperdeck HD recorder, which is 495. A time code generator typically costs about $900 for a good one. Our talkback converter costs, you know, 2665 you know, that does all the talkback stuff, but that's built in. We even have a micro converter SDI to HDMI for the, you know, so you don't need data monitoring converter, and that costs about $59. Yeah, the cheapest four port um, gigabit Ethernet switch we could find was about $37. Plus there's basically a Blackmagic cloud pod built in, which is $495. So all that equipment added up costs over $9,000 if you purchased it all separately, which is quite a lot of money. And it really shows you how much is built in. 
So we worked very, very hard on the cost because we wanted it to be as affordable as possible. So the new ATEM Television Studio HD will retail for $2995, which means you get a lot of portability, but it's also a much more affordable solution. It's a much more affordable way of buying it. Now the ATEM Television Studio HD 8 is in stock and it's available today. It's going to be exciting to see how people use it. But that's not all we've done. What we've also done is we've created an ISO model. Now the big difference is it records all the inputs. It's called ATEM Television Studio HD 8 ISO. And actually that's the one I've been using here all along. It actually looks the same, but they have obviously very different electronics internally. Now the difference is the ISO model has eight input recorders. All the inputs record as separate files, plus it records the master video file as well. Uh, so let's do an ISO recording and I can show you how this works. Now you select ISO recording in the ATEM software control over here. So I'll go down here. Um, I'll go into the, uh, put into the record palettes. Um, I'll select ISO. Oh, I'm already using the word ISO test. Um, now when I press record, all the inputs are record to the internal storage separately. So let's do that. Oops, that's streaming. That's what I want. Um, that also creates a DaVinci Resolve uh, project file. So let's do a few cuts and some transitions to show that. So I can do a few cuts and do some, oops, do some transitions. Oops. With that. Um, it's pretty cool. What's um, exciting about this is it's a whole post-production workflow. You know, while I'm using the switcher, someone else can do multicam editing. You can be editing a show and while recording the next episode. So it's pretty cool. So anyhow, let's stop the recording and have a look at what we just did. So there it is there. Now I'll come over to the uh, computer and um, what we get is we get a whole folder of files now. So let me show you. So there's the internal storage there. So now that we've got our test here, actually I called the other one ISO test even though it was a single file. So you can see inside I've got a whole bunch of different files. Um, now I've got DaVinci Resolve open in the background. You can see the DaVinci Resolve project there. So if I go to DaVinci and I can import the uh, project. Where is that? Open that up. There it is. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a DaVinci Resolve Speed Editor to do some editing. A Speed Editor is much faster. Um, so I'll move my little keyboard out of the way here. So I can scroll the timeline here as you can see. So you can see all the edits that I did. I cut along the cut bus over here. Then I did a transition and I did another cut and I did another transition. Um, so I can trim and change edits. So I can roll and edit. Even roll the one with a transition on. Um, I can also cut out parts of the thing uh, of the of the timeline I don't want. Now all the ISO files have program audio, so it's great because you can change between sources and the audio is seamless because it's cutting back to the same audio. And this is how I can cut pieces out and you don't notice. Um, I can also um, add and change transitions. So I can come along here if I want to add a transition. Um, I can go along here and add one there, or I can remove them. Now I can look at all my media and find interesting cutaways, um, and I can use the source tape for that. But the sync bin is actually better. Um, so I'll go into the sync bin. There it is there. Now it shows me all the cameras that sync to the current position on the timeline. So as I scroll the timeline, it'll actually uh, scroll all my cutaway options in a multi-view. It's kind of like having an assistant editor that helps you find the various clips that sync to the timeline. So let me show you. See? You can see all the different shots. So I can even play the timeline. Just put push on the spacebar. Now when I've got a shot that I like, I just select it. So in this case, let's select kind of camera number three. It'll put it in an out point there. I can even trim the out point by pushing the trim out and using the scroll bar to get the segment I want. And then I use the source override edit to place this clip in the timeline. Now it automatically syncs. I'll show you there's a button here called source override. And now what it does is it puts a it puts the clip into the timeline. You don't need any in and out points on the timeline. It's completely automatic because all the source media has matching time code. Um, but there is a faster way than this, even this, and it's called live override. Now it works when you have the speed editor because uh, you've got the uh, search dial. Uh, so all I need to do is hold down the camera number and scroll. So let me show you that. It's pretty cool. So say I want to put down a uh, shot here, like the bit where she's cutting the, the chili in camera number five. All I need to do is hold that button down and scroll the timeline. And as I'm scrolling, it's adding more of that clip into the timeline. And then when I release. So now if I push the timeline button, I can go back to the timeline. You can see the there's my cutaway. It's fantastic. You know, the sync bin is such a fast way to do multicam. 
Um, but of course, DaVinci is a lot more than just editing. It's also got color correction, VFX, and audio post-production built in. It's a whole post-production workflow integrated into the switcher. And it's a free download for Mac, Windows, and Linux. So you could have some people shooting in a studio while other people are editing and doing color correction um, you know, uh, at the same time. But uh, what happens if some people are off-site? Now, that's pretty easy from the project point of view because uh, I can share my project using Blackmagic Cloud. All you need to do is go to the Blackmagic Cloud website and set up a Blackmagic Cloud ID and set up a shared project library. Um, then you would, I would have imported this project into the Cloud tab. I just did it in the local tab, so you would have imported it into the Cloud tab and everyone can access it. So that's not very difficult. But what about the media? Now, that's easy because we have the switcher storage can be synced to Dropbox and Google Drive, which I mentioned before. So what this means, you can share your media worldwide in just a few minutes. So let me show you how this works. So I'll go to the, um, well, I'll move this out of the way. I'll go to the Cloud tab in the ATEM setup utility. Um, there it is there. Now I've already uh, logged into, I've got an account in Dropbox already signed in here, so I don't need to do that. Uh, all I need to do is add a sync, so let's do that. So I'll sync, and I need to give it a name. And I need to go to the internal storage and what I want to sync. So we'll sync that folder we just created. And then I go into the Dropbox account and I'll create a new folder, which I'll select. And there it is. I'll do it both ways. Now, um, all I need to do is uh, add that. So that you sync or start in a few moments. You can see it's just kicked off there. So this is how you can share media globally. Um, there it goes, it's pretty fast actually. I mean, we've got a decent internet connection here. Now the other editors can, and colorists can get their media from Dropbox, or they can actually sync it down to one of the Blackmagic Cloud stores and they'll happen automatically. So as it's uploading to here, if anyone else has got a sync set up on a Blackmagic Cloud store to the Dropbox, it'll be downloading within a few moments. So this media is now up on Dropbox, it's finished, and I can have that on the other side of the planet in a few seconds from here, because it'll be syncing now down to other Blackmagic Cloud stores. So the ATEM Television Studio is not just a switcher, it's actually a whole post-production workflow, a global post-production workflow, and it's all integrated with DaVinci Resolve. Now, well, there's one more thing that this ISO model can do. Um, it's a lot more, it does a lot more than ISO record. We can actually connect to remote cameras. Now, this is a little bit new and a little bit experimental. We actually have no idea how people are going to use this, um, but we can set up a remote camera to live stream to the switcher input. Now, it works with any of the inputs on the, on the ISO model. You can actually have up to eight cameras at the same time. Now, it works with OSA Broadcast G2, the camera will send a H.264 stream to the switcher input. It's actually really quite exciting. Um, but it, you, know, you can also use an ATEM Mini Pro or Extreme with it as well. You could use another ATEM TV Studio to stream to it. Now, pretty much anything that can stream video would work. But I didn't want to use an Ursa Broadcast G2 for this demo. I wanted to show you something new. Um, what I wanted to do was really do this with a Blackmagic Studio camera. Now, the Blackmagic Studio cameras are great because they're affordable and they're very portable. Uh, but what we want to do is... Um, I've been using a, a, a studio, Blackmagic Studio Camera 4K Pro here. Now it's a professional studio camera that's been miniaturized, so it's very portable. I've been using it uh, for the camera control demo. It's got a lot of features. It's got beautiful images. It's got incredible low light performance and a really flexible MFT lens mount. It's got a lot of audio and video connections and I've, you know, been, I've got it here. I'll come over to it. I've got it here with the focus and zoom demands so you can control the, the lens remotely from the tripod handles. Um, it makes photography lenses feel like the same as expensive broadcast lenses. Um, it's such a nice way to use it. Um, and the camera obviously costs a lot less than a big studio camera, but basically has the same features. But what we wanted to do is um, add a more powerful model of the family. So I want to show you that before I continue with the streaming stuff. So we have a new model of Blackmagic Studio Camera today. It's called Blackmagic Studio Camera 6K Pro. Let me show it. I'll, I'll bring out the camera. Um, I'll uh, unplug this guy. I'll move this over. So here it is here, I've got it set up. Look at that. Now I've got it mounted here on a tripod stand with a focus and zoom demand. I'll move this one out of the way. Um, what I'll do is I'll move the uh, Ethernet across over to this camera. So let me, oops, unplug this guy. Oops, I'll move my converter here. We've got a bit of a short cable. Now, how's that look? Um, now, it's power powered over Ethernet from the studio converter here. Um, so let's take a look at the viewfinder first. Uh, I think we've got a camera over here, we can check it out. See there, if you can get a shot of the viewfinder. Now you can see it's got a very bright um, HDR LCD. 
It's also got a tally light above the LCD and there's one on the top. Uh, the sunshade, there's a sunshade that's included and it uh, also folds down, protects the screen. Um, and it comes off, you can even remove it. Um, now look at the, uh, let's look at the side. I think I can get a camera over there and if you can get a shot of that. Um, so you can see we've got HDMI out and we've also got SDI out. So we've got an SDI program return input, which you know when you plug a video into that, you've got the button on the back. But that's also where we send the uh, the control and tally and talk back back to the camera. So the uh, camera operator can push the program button when they want to see the switcher, but they're also getting their talk back and everything through that. Uh, there's also a 10G Ethernet connection, which is how we've got it powered and all the, all the communications going through this cable because we're using the studio converter. Now there's two power connections. There's a 12 volt four pin standard broadcast XLR power connector, which is used in broadcast. And there's also a 12 volt DC, like a consumer, connection with a locking thread. So you've got a lot of range of power options. Now let's check out the other side. I think I've got another camera over the other side there, which you can see it. So I've got the two USB ports, so you can get that. There's two USB-C ports uh, for connecting discs for local recording uh, for Blackmagic RAW, plus the Focus and Zoom demand to plug into those USB sockets as well. There's two balanced XLR audio inputs on the side. Now these support line and mic level, plus they've got 40 up volt phantom power, which is extre and they're extremely low noise. Like we've got great audio on this camera. Um, you can plug in some great microphones, uh, but there's microphones built into it that are also really good. Um, I've also got the broadcast standard five, uh, five pin power, uh, sorry, five pin headset connection. Uh, plus there's also a video camera mic input, so you can use cheap video camera microphones. And also a three and a half millimeter headphone connection, so you can use just standard headphones. Anyway, let's check out the front. Um, all the best stuff's on the front, so you can see there. So the front's bigger uh, than the 4K Pro model because it's, you know, it's got a, uh, it's a 6K camera, so it's got a bigger 6K sensor. Now, the extra resolution gives you so many advantages. Um, you get better handling of fine image detail and anti-aliasing. Plus the extra resolution means you get full RGB color. You know, the, the extra resolution helps you recover full RGB. The colors are richer and the fine detail is much more accurate. Um, that's something we do on our digital film cameras. We always have a lot more resolution than what our target resolution is. So you get all that extra uh, capability. And we want to do that in live production as well. We have an EF lens mount, so you can use any common Canon photography lens. So many people have asked us about EF lens support all the time. So now we've got a camera with EF lens support and you can use those common lenses. The camera's got amazing low light performance, but really it's really exciting is we actually have uh, ND filters built in in the front. Now that's fantastic when you're outdoors in bright sunlight, plus the ND filters are electronically controlled, which means you can control them from the switcher. So let me show you how this works, it's pretty cool. Um, so I can do it from the ATEM Television Studio. So let's let, first let me select that camera on the preview bar so I can control it. Now I can see the camera on preview. And we'll go into the camera controls, which actually we're already in. But what I'll do is I, the ND filter is actually on the third page. So I'll push the camera page over here. And then I've got the ND filters. There they are there. So we can see to the back of the camera. There it is there. Isn't that oh, cool? They will are completely electronic. Actually, you might be able to see a bit better if I take off the lens. Let me do that. The guys will freak out if I do this. Um, so if you can get a if you can get a shot of the front there. Can you see that? And I'll change the ND filters. Ready? So you can see them mechanically moving. Pretty cool. I'll put the lens back on. I'm going to drop the lens. Imagine if I did that. There you go. Wow. Cool. So we have all the camera controls in here. It's, it's such a nice camera. Um, now let's check out the streaming, which is the original reason for showing you the camera. Now we can use a mobile phone to do that. So let me plug in a mobile phone so you really know we are streaming. Um, most phones will work. Um, they'll ask, often ask you to trust the phone. Let me plug in here. We go there. We should get uh, tethering activate. There it is. Uh, it's already been plugged in, so I didn't ask. A lot of times when you plug a phone in for the first time, they'll ask you to trust it, so you just push trust. Now the camera's on the internet. That's all there really was to it. So we'll unplug the ethernet. Um, then the phone will be our only connection to the switcher. However, we actually need to power the camera because at the moment the ethernet's actually powering the camera. So we'll also plug in some power. So let's do that. So I've got a power, simple little power cable here. Screw that in. Support, and then I'll unplug the Ethernet. 
There we go. So next we need to tell the switcher where the camera is. Um, sorry, we need to tell the camera where the switcher is. Got to get that the right way around. Um, so you do need to make sure the switcher can be found on the internet because obviously we're trying to send a stream to it. So you'll need some IT support for this. Um, this is important because the video stream needs to get from the camera to the switcher. So the switcher actually needs what's called a fixed IP address. Um, and basically the switcher needs an address on the internet where it can be found. And your IT person can help you with that. Um, we also need to tell the camera what the IP address is plus some other settings, but that's quite easy. But first, let's uh, set up the remote camera at the switcher end, and that's where we sort of start to do all this. And we'll do that in the ATEM software control. So come over and um, we'll do it. We'll get out of this. And we'll minimize DaVinci. Here we are. So we go into the preferences, and we go into sources, and we select remote camera setup. Um, so you can see this is where you can see the worldwide AP address shown here. Now when your IT person sets this port forwarding up for you, they'll give you this address, and so you would enter it here. In our case, we just manually entered it. But there's also an auto button um, down here where you can uh, add it automatically. Um, some internet connections support automatic setup, so you can just push the button. Um, but anyway, let's, let's uh, create a new source. We'll give it a name. Um, So now the remote camera details are ready, but we need to tell the camera about this. And we also don't really want to do any complex settings on the camera. So we can solve this problem by exporting the settings file. Um, it has all the camera settings in it. It makes it really easily, really easy. So let me do that. So I just push this button here. I'll go onto the desktop. There we are. Now, next we need to load this XML file into the camera. And we use a USB flash drive for that. So I've got one here. So I'll just got to load that, you know, save that file under there. But before we go over to the camera, let's do one last thing, which we need to set the input of the switcher to the remote camera. Now all the inputs you can see are already selected to SDI. So let's change one to the remote camera. There it is there. That's all we need to do. Now I can use any input for this, but in this case I'll use input one. Also another cool feature is the camera number is set automatically. So if you do move the camera into different inputs, the camera number will actually change automatically back to the camera. Uh, currently the input on the multi-view is black because we don't have the camera online yet. So let's go over to the camera and we'll set that up. So I'll get rid of this USB drive so I can carry it over to the camera. Um, let's come over here. So I'm actually using both of the ports on the side here, so I'll plug it into the Zoom demand. There. Now we can import the settings file. Um, now that's located on the stream page, if you can see that there. Let's go to the settings, yep, set up. There we go, across the page to import settings. There they are there, so we select that, import. There it is. Now next we need to check the streaming service. It should have actually automatically selected. So we'll go to the, to the streaming page. Oh, there it is, so you can see it there. Now all we have to do is turn on the streaming. There it is. And you can see the uh, data rate indicator showing some data streaming data is coming through. You can also see the video appears on the switcher multi-view. Um, there it is there. Uh, now this is all working through the internet via the phone. The stream is going out to the mobile phone network and back into our building via our internet connection. And the camera and tally control, everything, all, all the camera control works. Um, so I'll show you. See? So cool, the tally. Um, we can go to the camera controls, which we already have up. Um, we can adjust the iris, there it is. We can put in a bunch of reds, so all that camera control still works. Reset the channel, whoops, wrong, yes, that's the one. Um, and we can even adjust the ND filters if I go to the third page. This is so much fun, so it's so cool. Now the program audio is from the switcher is actually sent back to the camera into the headset. So you could do an interview with a remote camera and they can actually hear you, in the, you know, from the studio and they can respond to you so you could do an interview with that. Now this remote camera stuff is really exciting. I've got no idea how it's gonna be used. It's just a lot of fun to play with, but I think it could be really useful. Uh, obviously we'll be talking to people about things we can do in the future to improve it. Um, now it also works over the local network. Um, 
but you don't need the XML files for that as it'll just appear in the input menu if any of the cameras are plugged into the local network with the Ethernet, so that'll work too. Plus also the internet can be plugged into the Ethernet, not just the mobile phone. Um, so yeah, the um, switcher can just find any uh, cameras on the local network automatically, so that's how it'll just appear in the input menu, so you don't need the XML for that. So we think it's gonna be really exciting to have this new model of Blackmagic Studio camera. It's got the EF lens mount, it's got incredibly low light, performance up to 2500 ISO, so you can add a lot of gain. It's got a bigger 6K sensor for unbelievably sharp Ultra HD images, but it also records 6K Blackmagic RAW, um, RAW to external USB disks, which means you can link the Blackmagic RAW files and finish the project in Ultra HD. Um, so I think it's pretty cool. Plus the camera's got the built-in ND filters, which we're literally just controlling through the internet from a remote camera. Um, it also has the live stream built in. I think it's a really nice new model. Now the new Blackmagic Studio Camera 6K Pro will be priced at 2495. It's also in stock and it's available today. Uh, but that's not all we've done. Uh, we also have a new model of the Blackmagic Studio Camera 4K Pro today. Uh, it's called Blackmagic Studio Camera 4K Pro G2. It replaces the current model. It's got all the same features, but it also adds the live streaming. Um, now the camera here in the studio we've been using is actually the G2 version. It streams in exactly the same way as the 6K Pro model does. So we don't really need to show you that because it basically works the same. But the good news is the new model will be the same price as the old model. So the, it'll be priced at 1865. And the new Blackmagic Studio Camera 4K Pro G2 is also in stock and available today. There's also new software to support these cameras. Uh, it's called Blackmagic Cameras 8.0 and we'll post on our website today. Um, it also features a bunch of new, uh, there's a bunch of new features for the whole Blackmagic Studio Camera 4K models. Um, we've got an updated, uh, some updates to the user interface. There's improvements to the focus and zoom demand in the setup page. We've added Ukrainian and Polish languages. Uh, the new software also now write motion sensor data to the Blackmagic RAW uh, files that you record in the cameras. Um, it also supports Blackmagic RAW stills even while you're recording. Uh, plus when you do a future software update, the camera will keep your 3D lights and presets now. Um, we've also had the ability to program the uh, button on the NFT lenses, the, the function button on the lens, you can actually program that now as well with a custom function. Uh, there's uh, improvements to the screen guides. You can change them to different colors now. And the software also has better autofocus uh, performance. Um, and the cameras will now work with uh, those really large big LED video walls a bit better. We've uh, tweaked that. Um, we've also tweaked the heads-up display on the LCD to make it a little bit nicer. And um, we also fixed a bug in the 4K Pro model where the talkback channels were swapped. Now the mic's mono, but I mean, it's just nice to get those things perfect. And we also fixed a bug that could cause LCD glitches on some of the 4K models. So there's a lot of improvements in there. So it's a good general update for Blackmagic Studio cameras. And it'll be posted on our website today so you can download it and it'll be free of charge. Okay, so these new cameras are exciting. Um, they're the perfect companion to the switcher. So let's get back to the, um, to the ATEM Television Studio HD ISO. You know, it's a, it's a live product, uh, uh, production solution. It's also a streaming solution, uh, but it's a whole post-production workflow with all the multicam features. Everything's integrated. You can be shooting an episode of a show while you're doing post-production on another episode. It really is quite amazing. It's uh, very exciting. So obviously the big question is how much will the ATEM uh, Television Studio HD ISO cost? Now it's got all the same features as the ATEM um, Television Studio HD 8, but it's also got the eight recorders built in, which is similar to eight Hyperdeck Studio HD minis. It's also got eight um, ATEM streaming bridges built in for the remote camera stuff. So all that adds up to over $15,000 in total value when you think of all the equipment that's actually built into here. So again, we could do a lot better than that. Um, so our price for the ATEM Television Studio HD8 ISO will be 3995 and this is also in stock and available today. So I wanted to make a comment on the internal shared storage. I think it's such an important feature. It's so convenient, but it totally transforms the switcher into something much bigger. So all we've done is we've decided to create a special deal for anyone who buys the switcher now. What we'll do is we'll include the two terabytes of flash storage pre-installed in the switcher at no extra cost. So that means it comes with the shared storage, so you don't need to buy it. Now we'll do this with both models of the switcher. We'll, the switcher will have the storage pre-installed, but it's a limited time. We're not gonna do it for very long because um, we don't really wanna add to the cost of the switcher by including the shared storage permanently. Because if you don't need it, you don't really wanna have to pay for it. Uh, so normally it'll be an optional in, uh, feature installed by a reseller or somebody like that. But if you want to buy one now, if you get one of the first batch, then the two terabytes of storage will be included free. Now again, there's also a new software update to support these switches. It's called Blackmagic Switches 9.0. We'll post it on the support page of our website today. It's free of charge. We recommend installing that update. We've made some late improvements to the TV studios even after we started manufacturing them. Um, after installing the software, you use the ATEM setup utility to load it into the switcher. Um, we've also updated this, um, the example template graphics, you know, the graphics that we include with it. Uh, we've got some new designs, they look a bit more modern, and of course you can customize them because the Photoshop versions of the, of the graphics are in there. 
and we'll post that software update on our website today. Now, before I go, I did want to show you one more thing. Um, with the MADI on the switcher, we can really expand the audio mixer, uh, but MADI equipment can be a little bit expensive, which is a bit of a shame because MADI is actually great. It handles multi-channel audio, but it's really simple to use because it uses the same BNC connector that the video connections use. So that's very familiar to people like us that do video. Um, so we really wanted to use the MADI to add microphones to the switcher. Um, now we, we, so what we've done is we've built a new analog audio to MADI converter. It's called ATEM Microphone Converter. Let me show it to you, I'll bring it out. If you can come over. Here it is here. Um, so you can see it there. Now it's got four microphone inputs on the side, if you can get a, a shot of that. Now they're combo XLR and jack connectors, so they've got a lot of flexibility. Um, so the MADI and power connections are on the other side. So let me show you there. Um, now the analog audio on the converter is extremely high quality. Um, you know, it features a very low noise floor of 129 dBV. It features ultra high dynamic range of 131 dB. Each input actually has eight analog to digital converters all operating in parallel to extend the dynamic range. It has a very low distortion of 0.002%. It really is an amazing design. Um, it's a great way to expand the inputs and it's also very simple to use. Now we've got some switches on the side here that you can use to set mic or line level and phantom power. See it there? Anyway, let's, let's connect it up. Um, I can show you. So first thing, we'll plug in some power, which I have here. And we'll plug in some audio sources. I've just got some line inputs here. There we go, so give us all the inputs. So microphones can vary a lot in level a lot, so we've got some digital gain controls built in as well. Now you can adjust those using the Blackmagic Converter Utility, which is you can connect through the USB. Um, and they're software controlled. Um, the good thing is these gain controls work in 32-bit, so they're very precise, even more precise than the MADI. Um, or you can actually just add some gain in the switcher. Um, so let's look at the switcher. So what I'll do is I'll plug in a BNC cable from the MADI to the switcher so we can see how that runs. Here's my cable here. Um, so there's my MADI out. I'll plug across into my MADI in. There it is there. Now let's bank across and have a look. So we go to levels. I can bank across. I can turn them on. There they are. You can see the meters. Now, if you want more than four channels, um, then you can just loop to another converter because there's a MADI input. Um, what it'll do is it'll just stack the channels from the second converter above the channels on this one. And then the MADI input to the switcher would be eight channels in total. But that's not all it can do. Uh, we thought it'd be uh, fun to have some video monitoring on this converter as well. So it has a HDMI monitoring output for select, uh, connecting to a TV or computer monitor. So let's plug in a monitor and I can actually show you what that looks like. So let me bring up a monitor. There we are. Plug in a HDMI. It is there. It's a bit hard to work with my face in a the monitor. There we go. So you can see the display there. Um, I'll just come back here because I've got monitors in front of me. Um, so it shows the uh, audio waveforms of each of the audio channels. Now if I plugged in a second converter, the monitoring would actually change to eight channels. So it's a lot of fun to watch. Um, so I think this converter is a really nice way of connecting extra microphones to the switcher. Now the ATEM microphone uh, converter should be available in about a month or so. It'll be priced at $395. It's amazing quality. I think it'll be great help for adding microphones to the switcher. So that's about all we have today. Um, we've got the two new models of ATEM Television Studio HD switches. Also got the two new studio cameras. I love playing with the ND filters on the 6K Pro model. It's so, so much fun, you just do it all the time. Um, we've also got the new ATEM microphone converter. Our engineers have worked so hard on this uh, and I really want to thank them for all their hard work. Um, anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed this update and it was really useful. Uh, thanks for uh, watching and I hope to see you soon. Take care, bye.